Tonight, my esophageal sphincter would not open up and allow the food to go through. An ABC 27 special presentation. Once we cut that sphincter, it just it allows these to pass down much more easily. It has been a very positive, life-changing experience. Cutting Edge, sponsored by Penn State Health. Good evening, I'm Deborah Pinkerton. Tonight, doctors from Penn State Health are here to tell us how we can have the health we need to live the way we want. Learn how doctors are using the latest cutting edge procedures through minimally invasive surgical techniques. Patients will share their experiences with us and explain how these procedures have made a huge difference in their lives. And we'll answer some commonly asked questions like, what does minimally invasive mean? Who is eligible for this type of procedure? And what are the benefits? We'll answer those questions tonight, and viewers have questions too. Denise McCracken is standing by with more. Hi, Denise. Hi, Deborah. Yes, viewers are sending in questions right now, and tonight doctors will answer those questions about minimally invasive surgical procedures. And if you have questions, you can join the live web chat right now. Go to abc27.com slash cutting edge. Deborah. Thanks, Denise. A West Virginia couple turned to Penn State Health for help. The miles didn't matter when it came to treating their daughter. They traveled three hours to meet with the minimally invasive team. Here's Gracie Joe's journey. Thank you for joining us, Sierra, Zachary, and Gracie Joe. Why don't you tell us what was the situation when your daughter Gracie Joe was born? She was born with a thing called esophageal atresia. Uh, when she was first born, her oxygen saturation were dropping, so they knew there was something wrong at our local hospital. They then transferred her to Ruby, which is a West Virginia hospital in Morgantown, West Virginia, where they figured out that her esophagus wasn't connected from the top to the bottom. Um, it didn't connect to the stomach, so there was going to have to be a procedure done to fix that. We were put in the NICU, and she was there for about 67 days, and they did that first procedure there. And then um, one day we, she did come home because of everything. We had to teach her how to eat and drink. Oh, that is certainly a lot. So then other problems developed. Why don't you share them with us? Um, they started to realize after they fixed it, there was another hole that was going on. They called a fistula in her esophagus. Our surgeon, who was a general surgeon at Ruby, uh, said that he could not fix it with the tools that he had. So they had to transfer us to Hershey to where we would meet with Dr. Pauli to get it fixed. So Dr. Pauli, basically what he does is um, he has the specific tools that they can do something non-invasive. So that's why we were transferred to him because the hospital that we were at was not able to do so. And what did Dr. Pauli suggest? He suggested us to go with a non-invasive surgery. He would go endoscopically and either sew the hole shut or cauterize the, the tract from the esophagus to the trachea. There was multiple options and he really didn't know what he was going to do until he got down there, which he made us aware of um, before the procedure. He said once he sees what he's working with, he will then fix it to his best ability. Now, what was going through your minds? I mean, this must have been a pretty scary situation. Well, <laughs> from when she was born, it wasn't near as scary knowing that he was going to do a non-invasive surgery. I mean, he reassured us that this was almost the same day in surgery, where her first surgery took chest tubes and very invasive surgery to complete. So it was kind of just a smaller bump in the road for us. And how did everything go? Um, Everything... Well, now after the third procedure, but he told us ahead of time that the hole could reopen, which we knew that. So, and it did. So he had to go back in and try again. So um, eventually now we're to the point where we did a barium swallow test where they swallow um, something that they can take a live x-ray and we found out that there was no leak. So that was great news. Yeah, I'm sure such relief on your part too. Absolutely. And how is she doing today? Very energetic. Uh, <laughs> she wants to help with everything. She wants to be into everything. I'm sure you've seen her climbing around. 
she is just full of energy and a completely different baby prior to having the fistula in the esophagus. So we could see a, a huge energy change in her. So we're hoping it stays shut from yeah. now on. <laughs> so basically we were, we were getting the coughing and the choking and from this fistula was there. So after these procedures, we're no longer seeing as much of that. That is certainly wonderful news. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for sharing your story with us. And please give Gracie Joe a hug from us. Thank Will you do. so much for having Thank us. You. Thank you. And as you could see in the interview, Gracie Joe is doing really well. Zachary and Sierra cannot thank Dr. Pauli enough for what he has done to improve their daughter's life. And joining us right now is Dr. Eric Pauli, Chief of the Division of Minimally Invasive and Bariatric Surgery at Penn State Health. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. We talk about personalized medicine to meet patient needs, and really this is a great example of that. How were you able to solve this issue for Gracie Joe? Well, you know, for Gracie Joe, it really took a team approach. I'm primarily an adult surgeon, but we happen to work at a wonderful children's hospital with wonderful pediatric surgeons. And we partner with our pediatric surgeons and take our adult skill set and simply downsize it and translate it to a much, much smaller patient. And so for Gracie Joe, that required us to think a little bit about what tools we would normally use in an adult and figure out which of those would be able to be utilized in a much, much smaller patient. And we did it successfully. And Dr. Paula, you are no stranger to creating cutting edge techniques for patients. What other types of procedures have you developed? Yeah, our, our group uh, has developed procedures for minimally invasive and non-invasive surgeries, including other endoscopic techniques, uh, procedures to remove gallstones, um, procedures to close and manage other leaks of the intestinal tract, and also uh, some specific hernia surgeries that uh, were developed at Penn State with our group and are now performed uh, throughout the world. Wow, it is really amazing. Now, you have also expanded your services to reach patients in their own communities like the West Shore. Talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, with Penn State's acquisition uh, and uh, Holy Spirit joining our health network, uh, we now have the ability to take our uh, minimally invasive surgeons and send them to the West Shore. And so for patients who need complex care but uh, don't want to travel all the distance, we can meet them there. Some patients we operate on right at Holy Spirit. And some patients, we do their pre and post-op care there, but bring them to the main campus Hershey Medical Center uh, for their operation. So it's expanded our ability to care for patients on the West Shore. And what do you think the future holds for these different cutting edge techniques? It almost seems endless. Yeah, I mean, the history of surgery is the history of procedures being replaced by less and less invasive options. And uh, many of the things we're talking about uh, tonight would not have been possible several years ago I think next on the horizon for endoscopic procedures is the development and uh, dissemination of endoscopic robots to let us do complete surgical procedures the same way we would do them with our hands and eyes, but with a, a small robot that goes down through the mouth. Wow, that is truly amazing. Dr. Paul, I thank you. Thanks for having me. And we do have some viewer questions for you, but first, if you would like more information about Penn State Health if, or if you would like to schedule an appointment, call this number 866-506-3542 or visit online at pennsahealth.org. Now let's check in with Denise McCracken. You have some viewer questions for Dr. Pauli. Yes, thanks, Deborah. Here's our first viewer question. What are some common conditions that require endoscopic treatment? Yeah, I mean, the most common conditions where somebody might get an endoscopy would include a colonoscopy, which we recommend for screening purposes beginning generally at age 45. There are some people who need them sooner. And those patients may have no symptoms. They just own a colon that needs to be screened for the presence of colon polyps. From an upper endoscopy perspective, uh, things like heartburn, abdominal pain, and as we're going to hear, difficulty swallowing are things that require an endoscope and potentially endoscopic therapy. Our next viewer asks, I have gallstones, but can't have my gallbladder removed for other health reasons. Do I have other options? Yeah, that's a great question. Fortunately, it's not a very common problem. Most people can have their gallbladder removed, but when patients are too sick from a medical perspective to have their gallbladder removed, oftentimes a small tube is put through the skin of the abdominal wall directly into the gallbladder. 
uh, myself and, and my partners uh, will uh, go down through that tract where the tube goes into the gallbladder and actually remove the stones that are in the gallbladder and ultimately take that drain out. So while they still own a gallbladder, it no longer has the stones that were causing problems like pain and infection. It's good to know there are other options out there. Thank you, Dr. Pauli. And if you, you have questions, you can join the live web chat right now. Go to abc27.com slash cutting edge. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Dave's piece. Boom. That's what I'm talking about right there. This is Dave's faith. This is Dave's second chance. All right. Let's try that again. This is Dave's answered prayer. This is Penn State Health Heart and Vascular. You're watching Cutting Edge on ABC 27, sponsored by Penn State Health. Welcome back. More than 5 million people in the United States have a hernia. Many do not seek medical help. Joining us right now is Dr. Charlotte Horn, minimally invasive surgeon at Penn State Health. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're here to talk about hernias and you treat all different types. How do you decide which treatment is really the best type for each patient? So a lot of depends on where it is. Other things that are important that help determine how I should fix things is how big it is. What was the problem that led to the hernia, whether it was a previous surgery? And lastly, has it been fixed before and how it was fixed? Once we get all of that information, we can decide what is the best way to proceed with fixing the hernia. Now also, you do a lot of things to prep the patients for the surgery. Why don't you talk more about that? Absolutely. So I think it's very important that patients have a really good outcome after surgery. And so it's important that we get as much information about you and your health prior to determining what hernia surgery is the most appropriate for you. So things that I like to know before I meet a patient in person is whether or not they've had her surgery before, where was it? Um, if they've had a hernia surgery before, then we like to know exactly what was done so we can kind of figure out why that hernia came back. Um, additionally, we like to get some imaging because a lot of the times we have to make an, a plan for you when we fix your hernia. And so getting a CT scan is something that we do routinely in order to discuss your hernia, show it to you on imaging and figure out what is the best way to fix it. The other thing that's very important is to make sure that your health is optimized as best as possible. So things that are very important to improve your outcomes after hernia surgery are making sure that your blood sugar is controlled if you're diabetic, make sure that you're not smoking, and these all decrease your risk of a wound complication as well as the risk that the hernia comes back after we fix it. Now, Dr. Paul, I talked about robotics. What types of procedures can be done robotically? So robotic hernia surgery has really taken off, and now we can offer robotic, uh, robotic repair to even some of the most complex hernias, which is great for patients because that means you are in the hospital less longer or for a less amount of time. And on top of that, it does mean that you have smaller incisions, so you're back to normal quicker. So even some of the bigger hernias are things that we can now approach through a camera and small incisions. Dr. Horn, why don't you talk to us about the quality measures that you take to keep patients safe? What do they look like? So I really think it's important as a surgeon that you follow your patients and get good data so that when you see a patient uh, and meet them for the first time and talk about, about the risks and benefits of surgery, that you can actually tell them your risks, not what other data has reported. So when I meet a patient for the first time, we sit down and I'm actually involved in a nationwide hernia quality collaborative called the Abdominal Core Health Quality Collaborative. And what I do is I take all of your information, how you had a hernia fixed before, how I fixed your hernia, and then I see my patients basically as long as they let me see, see them. 
uh, either in person or a phone call. So I know how they're doing. And not only do I care that, you know, the hernia is back, but I also want to improve your quality of life. So part of the questions that we ask them at our visits is questions about how they feel that their abdominal wall function is, how do they have pain, and if they feel like they're limited at all, even after their hernia surgery. So Dr. Horn, thank you so much. Stick around because Denise has a couple of viewer questions for you too. But first, for more information about Penn State Health or if you would like to schedule an appointment, call 866-506-3542 or visit online at pennstatehealth.org. Now let's check in with Denise for those viewer questions. Dr. Horn, we have received a few questions about a hernia. This first viewer asks, how do I know if I have a hernia? A lot of times though, people will notice a bulge that they didn't see before. So common places are in the groins at the belly button um, or at areas of previous incision. And a lot of times people see something when they're coughing or bearing down. Um, and that could mean that you have a hernia. Our next viewer asks, does every hernia patient require mesh? And if so, how do you choose which mesh to use? So the answer is no. Smaller hernias can often be treated without mesh. That being said, I like to use the mesh that's the most durable, the safest, and the mesh that we have the most data about so that we know that it's ever been recalled and isn't causing a whole bunch of complications for the patients. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Horn. You've given us a lot of great information tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And Dr. Horn and Dr. Pauli will both be available with, to answer your questions until 8. So if you do have a question, you can join the live web chat right now. Go to abc27.com slash cutting edge. Back to you, Deborah. Thanks, Denise. A Dolphin County man had a difficult time swallowing food. So when it came to eating any meal, it was a real problem for Jeff Harper. Jeff shares his journey with us. Jeff Harper is an avid runner. My normal loop during the week is a four mile around the neighborhood. My neighborhood, uh, pretty hilly, so it's, it's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And then on the weekend, um, I'll stretch it out to five or six miles. Running keeps Jeff in shape. With seven marathons to boast about, Jeff needs to eat a healthy diet. And that's something he wasn't able to do for a long time. Well, it started probably when I was 45. I was sitting outside uh, eating an apple and uh, all of a sudden I realized it wasn't going down and it surprised the heck out of me because it came back up. And I'm like, what just happened? I, you know, what happened? And that was the first episode. I went to the doctor, um, did an endoscopy um, to make sure there was no structures or stricture, you know, any, any blockages. Uh, found out that there wasn't. Um, we determined that there wasn't really anything to do about it at that point. Over time, Jeff's food intake became more limited. I was unable to eat anything that had a skin or was leafy at all. It would always get stuck. So I went to, I, you know, like I love spinach salad. I've gone, you know, I went 12 years without eating any spinach. While Jeff's diet became leaner, so did he. It was getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, what caused me finally to, to want to do something about it is I hopped on the scale and I'm, I'm six foot four and I was 170 pounds. Jeff's gastroenterologist suggested he see someone with Penn State Health's minimally invasive team. When he came to see me, he'd been dealing with a disease of his esophagus, which is what we call a motility disorder. It's where his esophagus doesn't work properly. Things don't move down like they should. Uh, and his specific disease is called achalasia. And that's where the sphincter at the bottom of your esophagus doesn't open up. The esophagus doesn't push things down. And you end up having a lot of problems with swallowing. A barium swallow test confirmed the diagnosis. So patients swallow contrast, and as they're swallowing the contrast, we take a series of x-rays through their you know, upper esophagus and then down to their chest to see how that contrast outlines their esophagus as it goes into the stomach. Now looking at Jeff's barium swallow, his is a classic appearance of achalasia. He had a very dilated esophagus that tapered down to a very tight point, and only a sliver of contrast was making it through. 
a special procedure to treat achalasia was recommended. The surgery that we offer Jeff is called the POEM, uh, which stands for peroral endoscopic myotomy. And like the name suggests, we go down through the mouth with the camera, uh, down into the esophagus, and then we take advantage of the layers of the esophagus. We make an incision on the innermost layer, we dissect down through what's called the submucosal layer, and then we cut the muscle from the inside that's causing the problem. Did a little bit more research on other ways to fix my issue and realized that the POEM surgery was the best option and uh, took a leap of faith and, and uh, did the surgery on, on October 26th and it was the best thing. Now just food options are endless. My wife is a really healthy eater and she makes lots and lots of salads. Well, now I don't have to pick out the lettuce. I can just have the salad like a normal person. It has been a very positive life changing experience. And Jeff shared his story because he wants other people who may be in a similar situation to know there is a procedure that can take care of this problem. And joining us is Dr. Joshua Winder, minimally invasive surgeon at Penn State Health and Jeff Surgeon. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. You really helped Jeff with this issue. I mean, he was struggling for a very long time. How important is it for patients to be engaged and involved in their care? Yeah, so Jeff really is an ideal patient. We love having patients that they ask good questions. They want to understand their disease process and they want to understand the options that are available to them. So having a patient that's engaged, having a patient that, you know, follows along with the plans that we've outlined for them really results in the best outcomes. And fortunately, Jeff had a wonderful outcome. And what are other some other issues that you treat uh, minimally invasive procedure or do procedures that are minim minimally invasive? Sure. So similarly to what we did for Jeff, there are other things that we can do with the endoscope, uh, such as uh, myotomy of the pylorus, which is the muscle at the bottom of the stomach. So patients that have a disease called gastroparesis, which is where the stomach doesn't empty appropriately, we can go down and cut that sphincter as well to help allow that empty more readily. And those patients who are suffering from nausea and bloating and abdominal pain, really can have a huge improvement in their symptoms. So really, all of the types of surgery that we're doing, we're trying to make less and less invasive. We know that patients have less pain, they have better outcomes as far as wound healing, and they return to work and return to their lives much more quickly. And so we're really trying to swing the pendulum from you know, maximally or large and really invasive surgeries to as least invasive as we can do. Yeah, and that is certainly great news. That's what patients want to hear. Now, your team is all about finding solutions to sometimes complex issues. We have seen all these different procedures that have been done over the years. How do you work to find the best possible treatment for each patient? One of the parts that I love about working at this institution and working with this group is that we do. We do see a lot of very complex patients. And one of the things that we like to do is to sit together and to talk about them, to discuss you know, what are the best options that we can provide this patient? Uh, oftentimes, Dr. Paula and I will be in the OR together, uh, working together on patients to see if we can provide them with the best techniques to try and help them with whatever, whatever problem they may be facing. We had, we had a meeting just this morning visiting with various gastroenterologists, visiting with radiology, really collaborating between all these different groups specifically talking about patients and their problems and how we can best treat them. So really, I think working together as a team and putting all of our minds together, it really offers these patients the best outcomes. And when we're talking about patients, what about the ages? We saw Gracie Jo, very young. So what ages do you treat? We treat all ages, uh, just like Dr. Paul I mentioned. Generally, we work more with adults, but we work very closely with the pediatric surgeons and help them with various problems that they see. We really see all ages. Why don't we talk about research that plays such a huge role? Why is it so important, especially for these different procedures? Right, so understanding uh, what we're doing by measuring our outcomes, seeing how well patients do after the different types of surgeries we provide, really better helps us understand which patients will benefit from the, the most from any given procedure. That way we can tailor what we're doing for each patient and the problem that they're facing. If we're just, you know, treating them without really understanding why we're doing it or how, how they might benefit, we're really just hoping that what we're doing will help and not understanding 
who, who would best benefit from each, each surgery. And the research, is it taking place there at Penn State Health? It is. So we do a lot of research here. We also collaborate with a lot of the, the engineers and bioengineers up at State College, working with various uh, materials and biomaterials, trying to come up with different ways that we can use materials that they're creating to help patients that we see here at Hershey. Now we know that Jeff put off his treatment for a number of years. Now people are maybe putting off their treatment because of the pandemic. What is your message to them tonight? I would say this. So the pandemic unfortunately is ongoing, probably much longer than we all of us hoped it would be. And putting off uh, medical issues really isn't a great idea. Almost always treating problems when they first occur as opposed to when they become much more serious it's, it's much easier to deal with those problems on the front end than trying to catch up on the back end. Penn State really is doing all that they can to try and minimize the risk of COVID exposure for patients that come to the hospital. We have a lot of protocols in place as far as masking and testing to try and minimize those risks. And I really do feel like uh, this, this is a safe hospital to be seen at and to, and to receive procedures. Dr. Winder, lots of really good information tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. And we also want to thank Jeff and the Bradfield family for sharing their stories and you, the viewers, for sending in your questions tonight. And we also send a special thanks to all of the healthcare employees who are working during this pandemic. And if you would like more information or if you would like to schedule an appointment with Penn State Health, call this number 866-506-3542 or visit online at pennstatehealth.org. Now this Friday on Good Day PA, Dr. Krista Flitch from Penn State Health will be here to explain the difference between soon, quickly, and now. How to get the care you need when you need it. And a spine expert will be here to discuss when it's time to see a surgeon about your back pain. That's this Friday at 10 right here on ABC 27. We want to thank you for watching tonight. We wish you good health.